All right, so in this video, we're going to take a look at the final section of the mock exam, the multiple choice section. Uh, so we're going to start off with a specific heat capacity type question. So we've got a liquid flowing continuously through a chamber with an electric heater, and we've got a steady state where we've got a fixed temperature change between start and end. Uh, which one of these will increase the change in temperature with no other change? So if you increase the flow rate of the water, like whatever the liquid is, you'll increase the mass per second. So therefore you'll decrease the temperature change per second because if you have more stuff, it's going to take um, the energy sp split between more stuff. Uh, if we change it to one with lower specific heat, that means those particles or whatever take a smaller amount of energy to have the same temperature rise. So yes, that would increase it. Let's just check the others though. Using a heat element with a higher resistance, higher resistance would decrease the current, which decreases the power. So that gives you a smaller temperature change. And if we had a higher density, that that would mean there was more mass flowing through per second. So again, same as logic for question one, more mass would mean a smaller temperature change. Okay, so a raindrop of mass M falls to the ground at its terminal speed V, and it keeps 25% of its energy when it strikes the ground. So that means 25% of its kinetic energy is retained as thermal energy. So what would the change in temperature be? So this is how much heat energy is available, so that's 25% of the kinetic energy. And then we know Q is equal to mc delta t, so t delta t is equal to Q over mc. And then we can see just putting those two together, we end up with this expression D here. Moving on to the next one, uh, which one of the following graphs shows how the acceleration uh, varies with displacement if it's an SHM. So this is the relationship you should know for SHM, that the acceleration is directly proportional to the magnitude of the displacement, but in the opposite direction. That's one that describes this graph right here. So you can see it's a straight line relationship with a negative gradient. So it's going to be that one. Okay, so the time period of an oscillation of a simple pendulum length L is the same as the time period for a mass M on a spring. Uh, so what I've done here is I've got the two equations, one of the pendulum, one of the spring. Um, the length and mass are now changed. Which row would give a simple pendulum with time period twice that of the spring oscillation? So originally the two time periods uh, were equal to each other, but if we want the time period of the pendulum to be double that of the spring, what we'd have to do is multiply this L by 4, so when that 4 got square rooted that would end up being double. So what we need is um, L to be multiplied by a factor of 4 if m is constant, or L to be multiplied by a factor of 2 if m is halved, and we can see that's this one, uh, option B. Okay, so we've got a particle moving in a circle with uniform speed. Which one of the statements is correct? Kinetic energy of the particle is constant. Yes, kinetic energy depends on speed. So if speed's the same, kinetic energy is the same because they're both scalars. Um, so that one's going to be the correct one, but let's just double check. So we've got the force on the particle is in the same direction as the motion. No, if you think about it in circular motion, let's just sketch it here. The force is towards the centre, whereas the motion is tangential, so they're actually perpendicular. The momentum of the particle is constant. No, velocity is constantly changing because direction is changing, therefore momentum is changing because they're all vectors. Displacement, the particle is in the direction of the force. Uh, no, that's not going to be correct. The displacement is actually in completely the opposite direction. This is actually a form of SHM because the displacement is positive, whereas the force here is clearly negative. So that's not very really right. So we've got a body of mass 0.5 kilograms fixed at one end of the string, rotated in a vertical circle. And the fact it's vertical is very, very important. And this is the radius of the circle. We've got the angular speed. What is the maximum tension? So something is going to be equal to mv squared over r because it's in circular motion. And 
is the resultant force is always equal to the mv squared over r. So I've picked the position at the bottom of the circle because here that's going to give us the biggest tension because we can see the resultant force here is t minus w because they're in opposite directions so then when you take the double to the other side it, it adds on to it so that's why it's the largest and then you can plug your values in and get this value right here uh, with vertical circular motion avoid the trap of just equating tension and mv squared over r it's not as straightforward as that mv squared over r is equal to the resultant force Okay, so we've got two positions x and y at different heights on the surface of the earth. Which of them gives correct comparisons of the potential and angular velocity? So if there are points on the earth, they're all rotating, but the, no, a day is the same everywhere on the earth. So the angular speed is going to be the same. So it's therefore going to be either b or d. Um, but x is further away from the center of the earth so the potential will be less negative so it's got bigger so that's going to be option b there so because potential is always negative if you move away from the earth it becomes less negative so it increases okay okay so two similar spherical objects of radius r are touching the force of attraction between them is f when the gravitational force between them is f over 4, the distance between the surface of the spheres is... Okay, so if the force has been divided by 4, that means the distance is doubled because it's an inverse square relationship. So to get f over 4, the distance is doubled. So to start with, the distance between the centres of mass was 2r because they both have a radius of r. So the distance between centres of mass is now 4r because it's doubled. But so the distance between the surfaces then is going to be 2r. So that's option B. A repulsive force F acts between two positive point charges separated by a distance r. What will be the force between them if each charge is doubled and the distance between them is halved? So you can see this is your equation for the force between uh, charged particles. I've just written the 4 pi e0 as a constant because it doesn't matter. So it says each charge is doubled, so the top line is multiplied by 4, and it tells you that the distance is halved, so the bottom line is essentially quartered, giving you an overall change of times by 16, so the force is now going to be 16 times bigger. So we've got a positive ion has a charge to mass ratio of this value and it's held stationary in an electric field. Which one shows the correct field strength and the direction of the field? Um, so essentially the two forces acting here are going to be the weight force downwards. So if you think here's your particle, it's weight force mg is going to act downwards. And then the force from the electric field, therefore, must be acting upwards. So it's got to be either A or C. And if we equate the two forces, so we've got this equation here gives you the force from the electric field because we've got the field strength V over D multiplied by the charge. And then we want, we've got, uh, been, we've been given Q over M, so we've got the value of that. But we want field strength we want so volts per meter so we want v over d uh, so if we rearrange we get into this form here and if you plug in your values you'll come up with a over here uh, so that's the logic i used for that let's move on to the next question so we've got two parallel metal plates um, that have equal and opposite charges uh, which one of the following graphs best represents how the electric field strength varies with distance? So this is clearly a uniform electric field where the field strength is constant throughout. So that is going to be option A. Um, which one of the following statements about electric field strength and electric potential is incorrect? Uh, potential is a scalar quantity. It absolutely is. It's like a form of energy. So it's going to be a scalar. Field strength is a vector quantity. It's a force. So yes. Um, potential gradient is proportional to electric field strength. That's actually true. Um, the electric field strength is often called the potential gradient. Uh, that's something that's useful to know. So by process of elimination, 
uh, it could be it's going to be C but to see why um, so electric field strength is the potential gradient when it says field strength is zero that just means the gradient of your potential graph is zero so it could be constant at a non-zero value and with a but with a gradient of zero so then that's not going to be true okay so we've got a graph of potential difference across a capacitor uh, against charge on our graph um, which one of the following statements is correct so we're going to be looking at what the gradient of this graph is. So let's first put it into y equals mx plus c form, which you can see here. So we've got that v is equal to 1 over c q times by q. So the gradient is 1 over the c, or 1 over the gradient is equal to the capacitance. So that's going to be d. Which one of the following statements about a parallel plate capacitor is incorrect? Capacitance is the amount of charge stored uh, when the PD across the plate is one volt, yes, that's absolutely true. That's almost the definition of capacitance. A uniform electric field exists between the plates. Yes, they are. So we've got two parallel plates with charges on them. That's going to be a uniform field. Um, charge on the capacitor is inversely proportional to the PD across the plates. No, we saw from the question above that they're directly proportional to each other. So that's wrong. So it's going to be that one. So the energy stored when the capacitor is fully charged, proportional to the square of the PD, uh, absolutely it is. Uh, half CV squared is the form we're interested in, so we can see that's true. So it's going to be C. At one microfarad, capacitor is charged by means of a constant current of 10 microamps for 20 seconds. What is the energy finally stored in the capacitor? So we're going to end up using this equation here, so Q with E equals half Q squared over C. We need to work out how much charge is stored, which is why we've got this stage here. Uh, so we can work out the total charge, put it into that equation, and we end up with C as the answer here. When a capacitor discharges through a resistor, it loses 50% of its charge in 10 seconds. What is the time constant of the capacitor resistor circuit? Uh, so this is the equation that governs a discharge here so we know it's now at 50 percent of its charge so we know that q over q zero is equal to a half at this point um, so then we need to take log logs of both sides and rearrange to get just the time constant by itself plug your values in and it comes up as like 14.4 blah 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 uh, for so 14 seconds So the diagram shows a rigidly clamped straight horizontal current carrying wire, fly me, that's a mouthful, held midway between the poles of magnet onto a balance. The wire is perpendicular to the magnetic field direction. Um, the balance was zero, so it's not going to measure the weight of the wire, and it read 161 after the switch was closed. The current is reversed and doubled. What would be the new reading on the balance? So the equation we're going to use for here is f equals bill there uh, length is constant b is constant so we don't really need to worry about those so we get this expression the force is direct proportional to the current so if the current is multiplied by minus two because it's reversed and doubled force must also be multiplied by minus two so it's going to measure minus three two two grams okay Particles of mass m, each carrying charge q and charging with speed v, enter a magnetic field of flux density b at a right angle. Which of one of the following changes would produce an increase in the radius of the path of the particles? So what we're dealing with here is equating the force from a magnetic field and the force to be moving circular motion. The clue to do that here was the fact it was talking about radius, which is indicating it's going to be some sort of circular motion. Rearrange to make R the subject so we can see what happens. So you can see if you increase Q, you're going to decrease R. If you increase M, you're going to increase R. If you increase, if you decrease V, you decrease R. And if you increase B, you decrease R. So we can see the answer is going to be B here. 
A horizontal straight wire of length 0.3 metres carries a current of 2 amps perpendicular to a horizontal uniform magnetic field of flux density 5.0 times 10 to the minus 2 tesla. The wire floats in equilibrium in the field. Uh, that's going to mean the magnetic field force upwards would be equal to the weight force downwards. So that's what you can see happening on over here. We're equating the force from the magnetic field and the weight force there. And then what we want to do is calculate the mass. So rearrange to make that the subject. Plug in some values and there comes your answer B. Okay. <clears throat> So final question, you've got a jet of air carrying positively charged particles directed horizontally between the poles of a strong magnet as shown. In which direction are the charged particles reflected? So we're going to use Fleming's left hand rule. So we've got the uh, motion of the positive particles going into the page. We've got the field lines going across the page like that. So we can, by uh, aligning your first finger across the page and your middle finger going into the plane of the page, we can see that the force will be downwards. That's your thumb direction there. Uh, so we can see that we'd end up like that. Okay, and that completes this paper.